Hi there and welcome. You are listening to The Hoof of the Horse, a podcast dedicated to farriery and equine science with Dr. Simon Curtis. Today I'm in Catalonia in the foothills of the Pyrenees. I've come here to help with the examination of farriers in this part of the world and I've taken the opportunity to visit Marty Sala, who's been an excellent host to me, and we're going to talk about his life as a farrier. Hello, Marty. How are you? Hello. Very pleased to have you. Thank you. I'm pleased to be here. Marty, uh, you are a native Catalonian, and you've lived here all your life. But tell me, when did you first start to shoe? Um, Well... When I decided to become a farrier, Catalonia had no schools, no way of, of training. So then I started to search around different countries in Europe where I could go and study and learn the trade. And at the end, I decided to, to England because it looked the, the most professional school. And I went to Hereford School of Farriery. And I have to say that 30 years ago, that was quite a, a challenge and, and, and it's not like now that we are interconnected all over the world. But this is how I decided to start. And You were something of a pioneer, I think, then, because many of your countrymen have now travelled uh, to the UK and other parts of the world. And some have even now got our diploma, which you didn't have the opportunity then, did you? Well, at that time, it was really strange for me to to be in England because it was a lot of people from the Commonwealth and it was like clear that they could travel to England and to do their studies but somebody from Spain was really something bizarre and when I was there I was a little bit always like an exception I couldn't have a proper apprenticeship I wasn't allowed to have the exam. No I remember that (laughs) and I hope things have changed a little, but we are still perhaps too bureaucratic at times. And, uh, you know, having a law in England sometimes means that our Farriers Registration Council takes time to catch up with the way the rest of the world is going. But I hope it's got better. Well, for other horses are, are war technology. So uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I understand that you keep it to yourself and to England, but now it's. Everything is easier. And... I have to explain, because I realised I didn't at the start, where Catalonia is. It's the northeast of Spain, and it's really, on one side of it, on its, uh, on its eastern side is the Mediterranean, and on its northern side is the Pyrenees, these, uh, these beautiful mountains that separate Spain from France. So I, I forgot to say that at the start. So tell me, Marty, what type of horses do you usually shoe? Normally I love and and, and because I do eventing I love uh, show jumping and dressage. I think it's horses that they have long careers that you can help a lot with remedial shoeing and I love to to have clients that stay with me for 10-15 years. This is the type of client I have but then I also because when I was a kid I used to do endurance and I live in an area where they, it's plenty of world champions in endurance. Uh, the conditions uh, of the mountains, they are fantastic for training endurance horses. So I also have very good endurance clients. And we went to uh, one of your clients yesterday, mm-hmm. who's been very successful. I think he came fifth in the world championship some years ago. He's He's been always, he has been twice um, second in the European Championship. Most uh, of the time he has been first in the Spanish Championship with, with his very, very competitive. Uh, he was leading uh, the World Equestrian Games until unfortunately they... Yeah, none of us <laughs> can explain why they stopped it. Yeah. Um, maybe maybe because somebody from Spain was in the lead. No, we mustn't. We mustn't become paranoid. But you, I remember you told me that he doesn't come from a money background. That he that he's had to build this up the hard way just because of his skill. 
And, uh, this is one of the great things about endurance. That I think if you are a tough, hardworking amateur, you can make your way up. This is very difficult to do it in in show jumping or in in dressage because you need horses that they even as foals they cost already a lot of money. In here there's the type of horse that we have, it's a type the morphology is sort of Arab horse, light horse, that it's very suitable for, for endurance. And a guy like himself, a self made man, can work hard and create these athletes which they are fantastic and by keeping some of them and selling some of the others and also thank to the Arab people that 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 they pay quite a lot of money for these horses, they can make a living out of it. And and mm. it's it's great. Tell me, um what are the typical problems that you are confronted by with endurance horses as a farrier? I think that because they work on such hard ground, the, the main problem is that the food doesn't grow. doesn't grow, uh, it grows very little. Many times this is the, the, the main concern. You have to shoe. It would be fantastic to try and, and keep the shoes on an endurance horse for two months, which in another type of horse would seem very long. But because they don't grow in an endurance horse, it's good because then you have a little bit more hoof to trim and to... So, in, in the type of ground that we have here in Catalonia, it's very, very hard. And that's why we have to use tungsten pins. Even many times we have to quench the shoes to make the steel harder. And it's really incredible that in three weeks you can have a 10 millimeter shoe and it's gone. I know the horse that I saw you shoeing yesterday had four tungsten pins in and you showed me some old shoes which were totally wiped out but there was the tungsten sitting up proud. It is, it is a remarkable type of uh, metal, by far the hardest metal in the world and if anything's ever going to show it is the comparison with steel and tungsten on a horse's shoe. Yeah, I think that tungsten... We were very concerned at the beginning, thinking that the tungsten was going to do a lot of harm to the hoof. And I think that because these horses, they okay, they work on hard ground, but it's not uh, tarmac or it's not uh, concrete. I don't think the effect, the uh, vibrational effect is not so harmful. And it's the only way uh, many times to, to keep the horses going. So. Yeah. And, and I noticed you really... You shoe them quite short. I mean, at the toe, I should say. You don't shoe them short at the heel. You shoe them short at the toe. You really bring that rakeover point back. Yeah, I think it, it would be a fantastic discussion about this, you know. Uh, but I think that it's important that the, the, the point of rotation... I believe that the fatigue, that having a lot of um, leverage yeah. in, in a 160-kilometer race... Is not going to help so you need an easy movement and also it depends on which model of hoof you have on your mind myself i think the the the, the model is the model of a barefoot horse uh, which many times you could think about a mustang roll or which makes it very easy to to go and of course probably we could discuss if that would be uh, good uh, for a dressage horse. But I asked you, didn't I? First, the first thing I asked you is, do you show all your horses like this? And you said, no, just yeah. the endurance. Yeah. Yeah. That, that you, yeah, I'm not saying you give your dressage horse toe, but you, but you don't bring it back so Not far. so much. No, no, I think if one thing I try to do over the years is to do a specific shoeing, for specific horse, depending on the discipline, depending on the ground, depending on the time of the season, uh, I like to combine. And I, I'm not a big believer of one horse, one shoe. I'm, I think that that horse, uh, even depending on the disciplines, but it can go barefoot a part of the year. 
it could go on plastic shoes another part of the year it could go with aluminium it could go with metal and also all of these little things related to the pathologies or the little uh, problems that the horse can have during his career yeah you you said to me about how um, one of your enjoyments of doing doing sports horses is the long career and you actually notice how the conformation changes and the foot shape changes and therefore your shoeing has to be adapted to cope with or to help the horse cope with this. Yeah, I, I don't know if I'm the only unlucky farrier <laughs> in the world that has a very small percentage of horses that they keep with fantastic conformation from the age of three or four until they are 17 or 18 that they retire, you know? I find that there are very few horses that they can give this consistent, strong conformation that you can keep simple chewing, maybe with one clip. And I have some of these horses and I, I'm glad to have them and, and to keep it simple and to keep it beautiful. But I think that over the years, because of the stress of competition, because of the... Today, competition, it can be so hard that the horses, they tend to deform over the years. And many times they become uh, more upright, but also many times they can become low weak heel. And in these times is when simple classical shoe is not enough and you need other tools to make uh, the horses work and to keep performing at a high level. Yeah. That, that contrasts with my career where I only had to keep them going 18 months. You know, they came in at two and it's an old racehorse that's five years old, I tell you. So You're maybe so lucky. I was lucky. I was lucky. There's no doubt about that. Now, I learned something about you today, Marty, and I've known you many, many years and you modestly kept it hidden, at least from me, in that you represented your country in eventing. That must have been quite something. And you were very successful, weren't you, your team? Yeah, well, I mean, for, for me, uh, I've, 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 I've been riding all my life and I just, um, it's, it's my hobby. But because it's my hobby, because maybe because I'm a farrier, I look of horses with good conformation, good food. Yeah. And from time to time, I buy good young prospects that they are forgotten in the backyard somewhere. And some of these horses, slowly with... A lot of work sometimes with a little bit more patience than, than professional riders. I've been able to have some, some success. And this is what happened with, with this fantastic mare that we won the Nations Cup in Rome. And as a team, I didn't I win. I was, I think I was six, but it was a, a, an incredible competition and it also gives you a, a point of view in the way I shoe that, that it's interesting because some of the things that I try with my horses, I can really feel if they work, if they don't work, if I'm happy with that. That's excellent. And, uh, but I mean, it must be something, uh, you know, to, to ride at that level and with those sort of riders and the type of horses there, you know, for all of us in whatever field we're in, to compete at the top is something special, isn't it? Yeah, I, th I think that it's about details, it's about uh, working very hard, and it's not as far as, as, as shoeing top horses, you know? I think that every single little thing counts, and, and you know, it's, it's just... I, I also have to say that the standard of eventing in Spain probably is not as high as in France or in England, and that's why a farrier like me has the chance of being with the team, no? Because uh, probably if I supposed to go, if I supposed to compete with top riders like in England, William Foxpit or Pippa Fanel, probably I wouldn't have had the chance of going to to this competing with the with the team. But anyway. I was lucky enough. No, well, you did it. well <laughs> as they say, luck favours the brave, and I'm sure you made your own luck. All right, on this, on the, if we can switch subjects a little bit, you had an apprentice with you yesterday, Nesta, yeah. and um, and you always shoe with an apprentice, don't you? So, 
tell me, how does that work in Spain? Because they don't, they still don't have a farrier school here. I have to say that we are a little bit like mercenaries. I don't know if if is the correct word. Um, but over the years, I had many apprentices, yeah. and most of them they have been very successful. I'm, I'm very proud, and I've been very lucky to find great people. And um, for me, because unfortunately we don't have a chance of having a, a running school which uh, would be cheap and easy to go, we have to find our own way. And for example, Nestor now. He has been with me for two years. We keep working on English lessons, anatomy. We do it a little bit like a program of ourselves. And I hope that uh, not too soon, because he will not be ready, but that at one time he will be able to pass the exam. That's going to happen now. This week? Yeah. And I think that this is a good choice that countries that they don't have a normal school, people can go a little bit freelance, working by themselves at their own rhythm a little bit. And you know that sometimes they send you apprentices so they can improve about yeah. forging uh, maybe to you, maybe to other yeah. friends and in England. Because for me, the essential is that they keep an open mind, that they want to travel, Traveling, I think it's fantastic if you want to learn. So it, it appears to me as an outsider that the shoeing here is on the up. Now I know that maybe I get a view because I only meet the guys that are interested and, and whenever you travel to another country as a farrier, you tend to only to meet the good farriers for want of a better term. But nevertheless, I'm, I'm not looking through rose-tinted um, glasses. I do think here the standard is progressing um, but I wonder how you think it can progress further from now on not having a school it has also some advantages because we had nothing here nowhere to learn I had the chance of traveling to England to America to Germany to Switzerland and you realize that there are different methods different ways of approaching the profession and I think that this sometimes is also a fantastic uh, thing. Because if you, for example, now in France, the problem that they have, that they have such a strong tradition that sometimes the schools, they become a little bit old fashioned. Yeah. And that's not good also. I think it would be good to find a way that the learning should have a very strong um, based um, Traditional learning. Traditional learning. But, then, but at the same time, at one point, it would be good to be open-minded to, yeah. to the new stuff. And, and to be fair to farrier schools, I think um, it's in their nature that they have to teach what is believed to be known. And then do they have time to teach the others? Um, but I, I think they, they are aware of it. And the good schools, and I'm not just talking about England, I mean everywhere. Good schools also should prepare their... Their pupils, even if they can't teach them every new method, can at least say that they're there and, and, and again, try and create um, a culture of open-mindedness and uh, exploration and inquiry so, so that they don't uh, become like, I would have to say, some farriers I've met who are at 30 years old, you'd think you're talking to a 70-year-old. You know, they're, they're so firm in their ideas. But I, I think across the world it's improved. And of course, communication, uh, for example, social media has helped with that. And people here now know that they can pull in skills from outside of Spain to run short courses, whether it's a weekend or... And that must help with the education. Tell me, what would your advice, best advice be then to a young farrier, uh, a young person, I should say, who wants to be a farrier? How should they go about it here? Well, um, we have to wait and see what's going to happen with the, the exams. Yeah. And this, I think, it, it, depending on if it's stable and it's something that is going to happen every year, I think then it would be easier for the people here to start working. But maybe I'm selfish, 
because I've been very lucky visiting top farriers all over the world, my advice is always that you look for a tutor which is really of great value. Yeah. Maybe it's selfish and maybe it shouldn't be no, like I, this. I would agree with that. But we see that in the UK. We yeah. do have some very good farrier schools, but the, the most important factor affecting any developing farrier is who they train with. Yeah. Not even the facilities in the forge, yeah. not the facilities at the school or the teaching. It is the training farrier or the master, if we want to call a person than that, that has the biggest influence. I think they have 90% of the influence over the apprentice and the rest is just 10%. Um, okay, so I'll tell you what I'm going to ask you. We're here in Catalonia. So I want you to say to me in Catalonian not in Spanish, in Catalonian. I'd like you to say, Sir, please hold your horse still so that I can shoe it. Uh, senyor, vol fer el favor de aguantar el cavall que l'hem de ferrar? Thank you. <laughs> it's a little bit of fun that we have on some of the podcasts where English is not the first language of the person that I'm interviewing. So I think we've almost uh, covered everything, but I think I'd like to finish on by just asking you what do you think is the most important thing that you have learned during your life? It's a difficult question. I know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's why I left it till, till the end. I think it's a mixture no, of, of things, but I think you have to listen to yourself. And maybe this, this thing that, that, that follow your instincts and, and when you find somebody that you can feel that can help you and that you can learn from that person, to keep humble and to work hard and to get close to that people. I think this for me, it happens both in, 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 in shoeing horses and in eventing this way, it's how I met you. I yeah. remember the first time I came to Newmarket and I said, okay, probably I didn't know a lot about you, but it was some sort of magic, some sort of approach that I said, okay, you want to be to the Congress and I want to go and I want to, want to learn. And this all over the world, meeting different people, I think, I think it has been always very helpful and, and I'm very thankful for that. Well, that, that is good advice. <laughs> It's a longer answer than anybody's ever given me. <laughs> oh, <sorry. laughs> um, but uh, all, of it, all of it was good, Marty. And, um, you know, I want to thank you for being such a fantastic host. Um, I've already met a number of your colleagues. We've eaten well and uh, you've looked after me well. Uh, but tomorrow I start work because I have to be an examiner uh, in, in this new exam in Spain. But I want to thank you again for taking the time to speak to me. Uh, and it's just been fantastic. Thank you. Catalonia is very lucky to have you here. We're very proud. Thank you very much. Thank you. You can follow more of Simon's work on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. To get in contact, email thehoofofthehorse at gmail.com or if you're interested in Simon's books, please go to curtisfarriabooks.com. Thanks for listening.